Welcome to the Scrutiny Board for Adult Health and Active Lifestyle. Abigail Marshall Katung is my name and I chair this wonderful board. Welcome to the first meeting of this uh, municipal year. And it's lovely to see you all in this very lovely warm weather. So I dare not hear anyone complain about the weather today. So we all should be grateful. Okay, just to let you know as well that this meeting has been webcast on the council's website so that any interested members of the public or any or other stakeholders who are unable to observe in person can still observe remotely. The meeting recording will also be available on the council's website after the meeting. I will now ask council, uh, sorry, members of the board to introduce themselves and remind each and every one of you that after you've introduced yourself, you unmute your phone. I'd also like to let you know that we've got three wonderful new councillors on this board, two are newly elected, and one is joining the board for the first time. So if it's your first time as a board member, please do let us know that in your introduction. And I'll start with you on my left. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Eleanor Thompson from Geisley and Rawdon Ward, and new to the board. Good afternoon, everyone. Councillor Taylor and I represent Chapel Allerton Ward, and I do return back to the board. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Councillor James Gibson, Crossgates and Winmore Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Luke Farley, newly elected Labour Councillor for Birmingham and Richmond Hill. Good afternoon, Mohammed Iqbal, Mohammed Iqbal, Councillor for Hunslet and Riverside Ward. Sharon Burke, Middleton Park Warden, uh, I'm new to this board. Uh, sorry, Councillor Salma Arif, uh, Exec Member for uh, Public Health and Active Lifestyles. Thank you. Dr. John BLI, Chair Health Watch Leads, and I'm a hopefully soon to be co opted member of this board. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Councillor Caroline Anderson. I represent Adeline Wharfdale Ward. Good afternoon, Norma Harrington, representing Weatherby Ward. Steve, Stephen Courtney, um, advisor to the board chair. Thank you all for that and welcome again. We have three, we had three previous board members, Councillor Cunningham, Councillor Dowson and Councillor Flatty, and we would like to thank them. So if that could be minuted for their time, in the last year. Okay, I would now ask um, our principal scrutiny advisor to introduce, well, you've introduced yourself. Could you run through the first five items for us, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so there are no appeals against um, inspection documents, Chair, um, and there are no exempt information, no exempt items. And there's no late information, Chair, but there is some supplementary details which have been shared with members in relation to item 10, and that's the contribution from um, Leeds CCG and Leeds Community Healthcare NHS Trust and there's also some details in relation to the internal audit plan for 22-23 and that's shared with members and other contributors here chair. Um, item four is declarations of interest so if mem and any members have any declarations to make now is the time to make them and I'll take silence for no declarations. Um, and apologies and absence for um, substitutes. We have apologies from um, Councillor Hartbrook and also from Councillor Kidger, and there are no uh, substitute members attending chair. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, next agenda will be minutes of the last meeting, which was held on the 15th of March, 2022 and 26th of April, 2022. You should have all of that in your agenda pack. And I'll be asking for us to approve that as correct record of the minutes. Is that a yes from all of us? Excellent, thank you. Do nod your head so that I know, all right? Excellent, and if there are any matters that you think we should bring forward, please do not hesitate to say at the right time. Okay, back to you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chair. So item six is co-opted members. So the report sets out the um, details of co-opted members and how the uh, board can co-opt members onto its membership, um, which in summary allows for two standing co-opted members for the full year and up to five co-opted members for specific pieces of work. 
And the board for a number of years has opted to co-opt a representative from Health Watch and Dr. Beale has been that representative for a number of years um, and, and has been identified as Health Watch Leeds um, representative for this year as well. Um, so it's for the board to make that formal appointment and any other comments around Copton members chair. Thank you very much. Are we all happy to have our Dr. Beal? Yes, Chair. There you go. Congratulations, Doctor. Thank you, Chair. Right. Next. Um, item eight is in relation to the scrutiny board's terms of reference and the details set out the, the board's terms of reference and also sets out how the remit of the board aligns to both executive member portfolios and also the officer delegated functions. Um, this board has special um, responsibility in relation to discharging the council's um, general overview, health overview and scrutiny uh, powers. Um, so that's also set out in the report. Um, it's also worth mentioning, Chair, that members will be aware of the Health and Social Care Act 2022, which was um, passed earlier this year. And the report sets out some likely changes um, that will Im impact on the board's um, terms of reference in the future, specifically in relation to the power of referral, um, in relation to um, substantial variations or service reconfigurations in health provision. Um, that is being replaced by a general intervention power from the Secretary of State. Um, the details of that part of the legislation does set out that in discharging that function, the Secretary of State will have to consult with um, appropriate um, partners, appro appropriate organisations, and that includes local authorities. It also says that um, specific guidance in relation to that will also need to be provided. That that guidance hasn't yet been provided and indications are that during that the current year will be considered to be a transitional year where the two pieces of legislation will run side by side and the power of um, the general power of intervention will be introduced from around April next year but there may be supplementary guidance that's, that's issued but that hasn't yet been issued so that's, that's specifically just to note chair. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so that takes us nicely to agenda item number 10, and that's sources of work, work for the scrutiny board. Um, this report provides information and guidance on potential sources of work and areas of priority within our board's terms of reference. So members are asked to consider this information when discussing potential areas of scrutiny work for the forthcoming municipal year. It has also been a custom for the director of children and families, relevant executive board members and other re relevant senior officers to also share their views and to contribute to the board's discussions surrounding potential areas of our scrutiny board. So I will now invite the participants to introduce themselves in turn at this point, if that's okay. And I will start with Councillor Venner. Um, hi everyone, I'm Councillor Fiona Venner, I represent Kirkstall in West Leeds and I'm the Cabinet Member for Children and Adult Social Care, Early Years and Health Partnerships, which um, is about the Council's interface with the NHS, so I do some of the regional work around the integrated care system and I chair the Health and Wellbeing Board, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Sorry. Next is Councillor Arif, even though I know you did introduce yourself, but we scrutinise you, you're not a board member. <laughs> Sorry, I, I apologise. My name is Councillor Salma Arif. Um, I am uh, the Cabinet Member for Public Health and Active Lifestyles. Apologies, Chair. Thanks for coming. Kath. Good afternoon, Kath Roth, Director of Adults and Health. Hi everyone, Rob Newton, Associate uh, Director of Policy and Partnerships for Leeds Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust. Afternoon everybody, my name's Joanna Forster Adams, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Leeds and York Partnership Trust. Hello, I'm Lucy Clement, I'm a GP at Oakwood Lane Medical Practice, which is in Seacroft Gipton area. I'm um, Leeds LMC Liaison Officer, and it's in that 
position that I've been invited today. I've also recently um, been appointed a post as clinical lead for mental health in the CCG, focusing on neurodiversity. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Clement, for joining us. And we, you were given very short notice as well. So we truly appreciate your presence. Thank you. Okay, we, I believe we've got Shona. Good afternoon, everyone. Shona McFarlane, Deputy Director, Adults and Health. Thanks for joining us. Have I missed any one of you? Okay, I'm just going to pause for a second. There was item number nine that I jumped and no one picked on that. Please, if I do miss something, just let me know, okay? Thank you very much. That shows me you're following me. Oh, you were right. Okay, back to you, Stephen. Chad, you want to do item nine or come with item 10? Um, you can come back to item nine, Chair. Well, I'm happy for you to go on item nine now. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Chair. Sorry for that misunderstanding. Uh, so um, item nine is around local authority health scrutiny. Um, and this sets out some of the details associated with the board's discharge of that special responsibility to fulfil the council's statutory health scrutiny function. Um, the report sets out the um, fairly, fairly old now um, Department of Health guidance around local authority health scrutiny, but that's the most recent guidance available um, and that's appended to the report. Um, as suggested in the previous item, this guidance is likely to be updated given the introduction of the Health and Care Act 2022. Um, the report also sets out uh, draft terms of reference for the Health Service Developments Working Group. Um, this is a, a forum that's been established previously to allow health partners to present proposed service reconfiguration or developments at an early stage to help de determine the level of engagement and consultation with the scrutiny board, um, which is one of the re uh, requirements within the, the legislation. Um, so the board is specifically asked to establish that that um, that working group with the terms of reference as presented, subject to any amendments. Um, also presented are details of the West Yorkshire Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee, um, which sets out the uh, terms of reference of that that committee, and that's a uh, a joint committee that's been established across West Yorkshire. And it's a discretionary committee that's been set up voluntarily by the participating authorities. Um, as part of the, the role of that, that committee, um, it's for this board to nominate its representatives on that board. Um, and the representatives that are proposed are the chair and Councillor Harrington. So it's again for the board to, to approve those appointments. Uh, and as outlined in the previous item, it's also worth recognising that the terms of reference for that joint committee are set out in the in the papers are also likely to be uh, amended in, in light of the introduction of the Health and Care Act 2022. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much, Stephen. Board members, are we happy to reappoint myself and then appoint um, Councillor Harrington? Is that a yes? yes? Big nod. Fabulous. Thank you. Congratulations, Councillor Harrington. Thanks. Chair, and just, just for clarity, just the appointment of the Health Service Developments Group with the terms of reference provided in the papers, are members happy to agree that as well? Members? Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Right. Okay. So we're now back to item agenda um, number 10. We do have apologies from Councillor Hayden from Active Travel. So if there are any specific matters raised in relation to Active Travel, that could be follow, followed up later um, after the meeting. We also have got apologies from the Leeds Community Healthcare NHS Trust, the LCH, and we also have apologies from the Leeds Clinical Commissioning Group. So he, unfortunately, they are unable to be here today, of which I'm not particularly very happy, but um, we are where we are. Um, yes, Councillor Taylor. Chair, I'm very disappointed after the CCG and Leeds Community Cultures not being here today. We are just coming out of a pandemic and there's so many questions and we really need answers. Um, they might not have all answers, but we need something to feed back to the community, as it mentioned, community health care. We are having difficulty, well, I'm going to say it's we, but the community are having difficulties to access GPs and so many things mental health are going on and we just want to know what's going on to the feedback 
with no doctors and the ties with certain things, but it would be really good if they was here. And I take it, Chair, that they have um, would have had the same duration of time invited to this meeting as we did. And it's a shame that they could not get someone to just come and um, update us. Our last meeting was in March, and there's so much happened since March, but I think that we need to know that we can feed back to our community. I'm very disappointed alongside I hope our members and the board. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, do you want to come? Um, yes, Chair, just to confirm that um, all organisations, those present and those not present, were given the same length of time in which to prepare for this particular board, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. And that's been noted, um, Councillor Taylor. Um, we have had a meeting with both the LCH and the uh, um, Tim Riley of the lead CCG. I had that meeting with him at 8.30 this morning to, to, to discuss um, this and to say we are actually not happy that um, they are not here. So we will be discussing further with them. Yes. Chair. Thank you. Anybody would like to say anything regarding that? We're happy to continue. Yes, Dr. Bill. Yeah, I, I would agree with you um, that uh, it's a great pity they could find absolutely no one to come uh, and represent the CCG at this moment in time, um, even though it goes out of existence within the next two weeks. Um, but <clears throat> I, I'm very pleased to see at the other end of the table a representative from the local medical committee because we have usually the CCG, the commissioners, and the, the three trusts, the providers, um, but we don't have a representative of the group that provide a very large part of the health provision in this city. And I think it's very important that we do hear from the providers. So I was very pleased to see that we have someone from the local medical committee here with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Bill. And yes, um, I did say thank you very much, um, Dr. Fuck. And you came at very short notice as well. So yeah, um, the rest of our partners that are not here today, they will know and we have told them how we feel and we'll continue to do so. Going forward on this board, we have actually recommended that we will be inviting more partners and all partners to sit around the table with us because we have lots of questions that we ask and we're always told, uh, sorry, that's not my remit or sorry, um, uh, <laughs> that's not my department. So what we're going to try and do going forward, we do understand and appreciate that healthcare is so huge. And if we don't have the right people sitting around the table, then we're just going to keep sitting down having scrutiny meetings with the wrong people and with the wrong outcomes. So going forward, Dr. Bill, I can guarantee you that as a board, we will do all we can to ensure that we send invites way in advance to all the members concerned, partners concerned, to join us for further meetings for scrutiny. So thank you very much. Any other comments on that? Okay. So who will like to go first? Will it be yourself, Kath, or will it be Councillor Venner? Oh, is this with regard to priorities for next year? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So for okay. agenda item number sure. 10, sources of work for the school yeah. board. So these would be my suggestions. Um, obviously, you've had as a standing agenda item to get an update on what's happening with the um, implementation of the new Act and the ICS coming into existence. So I think it makes sense for that to continue, that that's a regular agenda item. I think it's basically been every six months you've had an update and key people have come. Um, Tim will still be, Tim Riley will still be the accountable officer for, for Leeds. So I think it's been him who's come to the board. So I would suggest that continues going forward. Um, the other areas which are, are, are dominant within um, health and social care. I mean, it won't be any, any surprise to you to hear that um, the cost of living crisis is coming up in pretty much every meeting I go to, um, bearing in mind I've got the children's um, portfolio as well. When we went to children's scrutiny to present the outstanding Ofsted report, we were asked, um, Sal, Tariq and myself, what we thought the biggest challenge was going forward. Without having conferred with each other in advance, we both said poverty, that we saw that as by far the biggest, the biggest um, challenge facing children's social care. 
um, and it obviously has profound impacts on people's health and well-being. So I know that is being considered in a number of different forums within within the council. I chair the Child Poverty Strategy Board, and I don't know if you would want to sit to look at that as a board from um, the perspective of the health implications of um, of the crisis that we're in. Um, there's also a there's a series of breakthrough projects which are happening within the council and with our partners, which are about areas where the council wants to prioritise energies linked to the kind of um, best council plan. It's not called that anymore, is it? What's it called now? <laughs> City ambition. Best city ambition. Thank you. Um, one of the breakthrough projects is uh, about health and housing. And we also had housing as a substantive agenda item at a recent health and wellbeing board. And I think the pandemic really, really magnified the impact of housing on people's health, particularly the periods of lockdown where, the, where your home could be a place of sanctuary and a place that helps your mental health and well-being, or the absolute opposite. And all councillors, particularly those of us within the city wards, have seen an, such an exponential rise in our housing casework um, uh, over the pandemic and since the pandemic. Because I think housing, um, during a period of kind of, uh, during a global crisis, I think people's housing and the, the situation they're living in has been so highlighted. So, um, I don't know if you want to link in with that breakthrough project in some way in terms of the, the, the inextricable links between health and housing. Another area that I'm just sort of throwing in really, which is an area of, that I'm working on particularly myself at the moment is, um, so every member of the Health and Wellbeing Board is paired with a third sector or community-based organisation. It's a programme called the Allyship Programme, which I'm really proud of. It's linked really senior people with um, individuals working in grassroots organisations. And our task is to do a project around health inequalities. And I'm paired with the Gypsy and Traveller Exchange, which I'm loving. And I also chair um, the Gypsy and Traveller Working Group on behalf of the Cabinet because Gypsy and Travellers technically aren't in my portfolio but actually the needs of the community are in all our portfolios and so on behalf of my colleagues I chair the Gypsy and Traveller Working Group which is cross-council it includes people from planning, asset management, um, the Gypsy and Traveller team, public health, children's services it's really urgent piece of work because of the police crime sentencing bill, which absolutely criminalises the traveller way of life. And if the act is implemented the way it's passed through Parliament, it's barbaric. You know, people can have their, if people are camped illegally, they can have their vehicle seized, which are obviously their homes, which could lead to children coming into care. The implications are massive, which is why it felt really urgent to set up this group and do some specific work. And the priorities we're working on Gator involved in it as well, which involves people from the community. The priorities we're working on are around the urgent need for more pictures, both permanent pictures and pictures of people passing through, mental health and suicide in the community, and children's access to education. Where this overlaps with your work is I first met Gypsy and Traveller Exchange when they presented at the Health and Wellbeing Board. The health outcomes, Gypsies and Travellers, are they must pretty much be that have some of the worst health outcomes of any group. So the, the, the average life expectancy of a traveller is something like something like 52, but I just read something recently in the Irish Times that 50% of travellers don't get past their 39th birthday and 70% don't get past their 59th birthday. I don't know if that's specific to Irish travellers, but certainly in terms of really poor you know, health outcomes, um, high rates of substance use, we've identified mental health and suicide as a priority. It's a community with um, major health challenges and who are un under particular stress at the moment because of the police crime and sentencing bill, which has the most horrible implications. So I know that's a bit of a, that's probably not one, one you weren't expecting. Um, the others are probably a bit more predictable, but I just wanted to throw that in as a piece of work that I'm really proud we're doing as a council at the moment and, and, and 
but it's great to have the relationship with Gate. So I'll leave that there and um, hand over to, um, I guess, Councillor Arif next and then Kath and Victoria. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Venner. Very helpful. Yeah, Councillor Arif. Thank you, Chair. And just to echo um, Councillor Venner's point about the allyship, I'm also on the allyship and I've certainly taken so much from it. I think it's it's really wonderful. And um, I, I guess a couple of things from, from, from my perspective. Um, so obviously, we're going to talk about this in, in the agenda item 11. The biggest challenge we've got um, coming away and out of the pandemic is the health inequalities. Um, and in terms of some of the work that we're, we're planning on doing is, is uh, I'm sure you've perhaps heard that we're committing to being a mom at City. And I think perhaps that's something um, for, 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 the, for the board to consider in terms of how we, we go about doing that work and any insight we can have. Obviously, I think we've discussed with, with Councillor Venner as well, it's about our children having the best start to life, but also we need to look at sort of the wider determinants of, of health. So I think that's that's a massive opportunity for us and that's something that we need to um, obviously focus on. So that's sort of, that's one area. And the other, other thing, I'm not sure if I'm probably, I won't say exactly where, but in terms of active uh, lifestyles, but we're actually um, running or thinking of putting a campaign together. And we are, it's a pilot scheme that looks at um, sort of barriers in terms of cost not being a barrier to, to, to get to our leisure centres. And we're, we're in the process of, of getting things going in a particular area. I don't think I'm allowed to say where at this point. So I just think that's that's perhaps, because I think in the past we have talked about that as, a, as an issue. Um, and those people that perhaps um, are on, 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 on universal credit is getting to the leisure centre a cost of barrier. So that's, that's a piece of work that I think that's going to be quite uh, important for us. So any input in that in terms of how that pilot runs and perhaps building a case for it to be um, the re we go uh, across the rest of the city. So those are sort of the two suggestions I would make and, and, and they're linking with the health inequalities and the active lifestyles. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Arif. Um, I was honoured to attend a public health um, conference yesterday, um, wonderfully organised by Victoria's team and gracefully opened by Councillor Arif. And that was amazing. The theme was about the power of connections and it was just great to see um, our different health organizations in the city working together um, post-COVID. And I must say that was really, really remarkable. And I wish you could bring all of them who spoke yesterday to, to be here in this room, just for all of you to hear how much work has been going on in this city, both by volunteers and those in the healthcare sector to you know to 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 help fight inequalities um in our city so i just want to throw that in there and say thank you very much to yourselves and your team for putting that together and for all the work you do in public health thank you who's going next okay um i would suggest two things to scrutiny board members one is to uh, understand in detail the proposed social care reforms, which have three aspects to them. There's one called fair cost of care and a market sustainability plan that we have to do. The second one is charging reform that affects what individuals mm -hmm. pay for the cost of their care and the introduction of a cap on care and the establishment of care accounts. And then finally, we will see the reintroduction of inspection of adult social care and what that inspection regime might look like. The second one I was going to suggest is having a look at the uh, liberty protection safeguards that will be introduced. Um, that's the new language for work around deprivation of liberty. Um, it's currently being consulted on. So if you were to look at that, I'd do it towards the end of the uh, scrutiny calendar when we get a final version of what it is that they think will be the new regime around um, liberty protection safeguards. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Chair. And I'll just introduce myself because I've not done already. I'm Victoria Eaton. I'm the Director of Public Health at Leeds City Council. So um, I'd very much support everything that Councillor Benner, Councillor Arif and Kath has already said, um, and particularly, um, as you'd expect me to say, around that focus on health inequality and just just, just keeping, a, we will get onto it later on in this 
conversation, I'm sure, but 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 um, to keep a close watch on what's happening around our um, health inequalities position. Um, the other two um, things it might be worth just having to think about um, is around the um, health impact of climate change. Um, and I guess getting to some of the specifics around um, what does that mean for um, pr health priorities within the climate change agenda, because there are some quite specific um, new emerging challenges that come with the changing climate, whether that's new infectious disease or um, you know, migration of people, et cetera. So just thinking that through from a health point of view. Um, and I guess the other thing was um, that one of the things we tried to do at the conference yesterday was to um, not lose the learning from COVID and what we've all been through. So um, there were some conversations and I know lots of, all of us will have uh, thoughts about learning from COVID, learning the lessons from COVID. And, and I think particularly strong is about um, kind of long-term trusted relationships with communities and how we want to do that better and differently um, across the, the wider health community. So um, it, it might be something the, the board might be interested in looking at. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, Rob? Hi. Um, yes. Yeah, so from um, from Leeds Teaching Hospital. So, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you briefly about our our priorities and our challenges the year ahead, um, and then um, uh, maybe one or two specifics. So, obviously, huge focus for us as an organisation on elective recovery, um, uh, with a lot of patients on waiting lists, both long waiting lists um, and just the volume of, of um, patients and um, that's so that's a, a huge focus for us obviously um and um welcome um scrutiny um there are non-elective challenges um so um uh patient flow through our hospitals and um the uh the length of time that people are waiting in a e departments is a, a a concern for us and then obviously our uh, the new hospitals program so the big developments across which we um, engaged to some degree with the scrutiny board before uh, particularly on maternity services um, and then um, I guess to echo things that people have so uh, the liberty protection of safeguard that will be a, an item which will be relevant to us as a trust um, and then on the inequalities piece, there's some there's lots of interesting work going on across health partners as well. Um, and it might be um, it might be prudent to think about well, what's the contribution of um, of us as um, health and social care providers in um, both our role as an employer um, uh, as a procurer. So as an anchor organization, but also if we think about um, people that are waiting on our waiting lists. Or people that are waiting uh, that that present to our hospitals um, acutely, um, the the various uh, impact of inequalities on that, and how we might be able to support people better and improve access, particularly for the most disadvantaged. And that's an area of focus for us as an organisation. I know it is for other trusts as well. So there's uh, there could be could be some interest there. I think. Thank you very much. Yeah, the. Um... CCG have also shared waiting lists. There's a very, um, very important thing that we are definitely concerned about um, here. And I know it's not just Leeds, it's, um, it's a national issue as well. So definitely will be something we would be looking into. So thank you very much for that, Rob. Um, Joanna. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so similarly to Rob, if I just focus on the priorities for the organisation in the first instance, and then there's a huge amount of commonality, I think, in terms of what we've all already said today. So from a Leeds and York Partnership Trust perspective, one of the key strategic themes for us and key areas of focus are workforce challenges and workforce crisis. And in particular, I'm saying that in the context of our second uh, priority, which is responding to and managing increases and changes in demand from a mental health perspective. So just to give some highlights there, what we know in our city is that we are seeing a significant increase in adolescent eating disorders. For example, uh, we are seeing an increase in primary care mental health referrals of up to 24%. In our uh, adult, um, in our 
Leeds Autism Diagnostic Service, we've seen increases recently of 40% of pre-pandemic rates. Uh, and, and in our ADHD service, we've seen increases of 65% of demand uh, over and above pre-pandemic uh, rates. We're also seeing significant increases in uh, acuity of people with mental illness. So we are seeing a deterioration in their condition uh, borne out through the pandemic, uh, which we are managing at this point in time, but we're anticipating with the help of Victoria's colleagues in a further increase in terms of that acuity. Um, so that is an area of focus for us. Our third uh, strategic priority, uh, which may be of interest in the future uh, for scrutiny is our future estate. What that means is uh, having the right provision and the right, um, the right place for people to receive the right level of care and the right level of support, which I think will be of particular interest. Health equity is undoubtedly an issue for us and one that I think all colleagues here have um, already said. I just want to amplify from a serious mental illness perspective, we want to consider this, particularly in terms of the physical health of people with a serious mental illness. One of the key pieces of learning for us uh, through the pandemic was really acknowledging and understanding that people in that position are highly unlikely to come forward in a traditional way to receive physical health care or to access physical health care. We want to make sure that we really lead the way in Leeds, making sure that those people have tailored and really focused ways of working with them to ensure that the current gap in their um, lifetime is reduced significantly. So that's a key area of focus for us as an organisation, which I would really seek support through the city. The two other areas which I've already heard colleagues around the table mention today are about accessibility into mental health services and in particular uh, tailoring that accessibility to people and areas who need more help. We know and have learned more recently that we will be accidentally excluding people just by the services that we provide and the accessibility into those services. So we really want to focus over that, on that over the course of the next year. And the second key area in terms of health equity is about the experience of people in our services. We've known for some considerable time that the experience of people can be um, can change as a consequence of their background, their characteristics, or even where they come from. We want to make sure that that is not tolerated in the future and that in fact, everybody has equal experience and high quality experience of mental health services. There are key areas of focus, uh, but I think the health equity thing I have heard from colleagues is a key theme for us and one uh, that we would really appreciate support with. Thank you very much, Joanna, for that. Actually, that brings us nicely talking about mental health. So I would like to call on um, Dr. Lucy Clement, because um, when we met with LMC, um, mental health services was something that was really, really huge on the agenda that afternoon. So over to you now. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you again for the invitation and uh, certainly something that we would welcome as an ongoing annual um, opportunity. Um, so, yes, we were invited to, to, to come and discuss um, patient access to GP services and capacity pressures within GP services affected by the increasing number of patients with mental health conditions, quote, ping-ponging between primary and secondary care mental health services. Um, certainly since the start of the pandemic, we've seen more and more people needing help and support for their mental health problems, but it's becoming harder and harder for us to get that help for patients. And this is because the mental health services themselves are overwhelmed. Um, they're you know, struggling themselves with the increased demand for their services. Their workforce like ours are struggling themselves with burnout and overwhelm, um, and they're struggling to recruit. Um, I was invited to a meeting um, with Leeds Mental Wellbeing event um, in May at the Shine in Hare Hills, um, titled Finding the Right Help for Patients with Complex Needs. Um, it was clear in those discussions just how much the service is struggling. And their response is to tighten their criteria, who they can help, discharge patients early who DNA and struggle to engage, or often tips instead for self-care. But the problem is that the, these are people who are these are people who are struggling themselves. They're overwhelmed. They are finding it hard to self care, and in this moment of crisis, they need something that's easy to access, not harder. And the the consequence on us as general practitioners 
is that we have a catch-22 of these frequent attenders in this vicious cycle, unable to get the help that they need. And we are, as GPs, trying our best to support these individuals, but that we are limited with our short appointment times and our skills to identify these rather complex underlying issues, which often span an entire lifetime. Some cases are straightforward and a crisis is short lived and we are able to do a mini intervention in an appointment and offer a sick note. And that might be all that they need. But in reality, the really, really hard, it's really, really hard to get the right support for them for the more complex patients. Is it me doing something with my mic? <laughs> Sit back a bit Is and that, relax. Relax. That's it, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really, really hard. Can you still hear me? Yeah. It's really hard to get the right support for our more complex patients who don't fit neatly into boxes. You know, many patients have addiction problems, chaotic lifestyles. They experience trauma. They've got difficulty regulating their emotions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we've got intersectionality that we need to deal with, and we can't just pigeonhole people into boxes or reject them if they don't. So what are the solutions here? We need to stop looking for quick fixes. We need to acknowledge that patients need more than a sticking plaster. And rather than reject and block referrals, what can be offered instead to help us as GPs help these patients in the meantime where they're, while they're waiting? They do need longer appointments that are easier to access with people who are skilled to pick out the themes across their lifetime, identifying the underlying causes and diagnoses that might sit under these reoccurring presentations, and finally getting the patient the support and the self-understanding that they need. And this will hopefully increase their chance of breaking the vicious cycle that they're in and increase the chance that they will eventually self-care. But this obviously needs money to invest into the workforce and an available and unavailable pool of skilled workforce to employ. We have some excellent mental health, health clinicians at our practice. They're well used, very appreciated, and they're really helping people. But our fabulous alcohol counsellor recently left and we can't recruit another. Our PCNs are using the hours money to try and increase the workforce, but we're struggling to recruit. And when we do, we're often robbing Peter to pay Paul as it leaves a gap in another service. And once they are recruited, they become quickly overwhelmed themselves. And often our practices don't have enough room, even if we employ more, to actually have them working in our practice. So how can the board help? Please can we encourage partnership work across all sectors to maximise the workforce resource in the city? This will help to reduce duplication and hopefully close the gap in service provision. There needs to be an offer for all people, regardless of their perceived complexity. And a high skilled input at the point of triage is worth it. Um, let's ensure that GP practice premises and needs get sufficient investment, including help to improve the IT infrastructure so that we can employ or invite more people to use our buildings. So in addition to the mental health aspects, I did want to mention long waiting lists. It's a theme. And the long waiting lists are having a huge impact on general practice. Can the providers adjust their offer perhaps somewhere between the advice and guidance that we currently can use and the diff and 100% and referral? The cardiology team are very, being very inventive, for example, at the moment thinking what a patient might need, offering that, and then feeding back to us once they have done a small intervention, rather than thinking it as, as a sort of one, a binary offer, either no, we can't see them, or yes, we'll do everything for them. Interface work. I'm really excited about the ICS and what it's going to offer in terms of how we can communicate with each, with each other as providers and have a better understanding of each other's needs and pressures. And hopefully this will help us to find solutions that are good for patients and the workforce, considering what both primary and secondary care need in order to do the work we're being asked to do. We have an issue with expedite letters. Not a single day goes by in general practice without us being asked to write an expedite letter. It's taking up an appointment each time. 
Hospitals need to be honest with patients about the waits and be clear about the circumstances that would really result in a successful expedite request. Telling all patients to contact their GP is wasting appointments and admin time and increasing workload for hospitals. My priorities and our priorities for general practice will be to increase access to general practice, understanding how we work together as an ICS, as I've mentioned, and a real focus on workforce wellbeing. Thank you very much, Dr. Clement. And I can even hear a pin drop. And that's exactly how I felt when we attended the meeting and what we heard. And that was the main reason why I thought it will be good for the board and other partners to hear from the LMC, for people who wear the shoes and are dealing with the issues every single day. This is the reality. And I've just got goosebumps at the moment because when I think of the ordinary person who has no idea how to navigate the system, how can they even cope? Where do they even start from? And that breaks my heart, you know, especially as an elected member representing um, communities, especially deprived communities. Um, it, is, it is painful to hear, but at the end of the day, we're around this table because we're not just here to hear problems, but we're here to solve problems. And I know that together we can. So thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts, um, Dr. Clement, for that. And I am certain that we will continue to work together and make sure that all the different partners around this board and that we find tangible and long-term, short-term solutions to where we currently are. I don't think it's even the hospitals themselves, I can say, is it what is are they where they would like to be? I don't think the answer is yes, but I am certain for every problem, there has to be a solution somehow. So thank you very much. Um, I will call on Steve. I'll tell you a little thing about Steve. We had um, a little site visit not too long ago um, with members of this board. We had lovely lunch. You all know I love food, right? And it was really healthy food. And Steve took us, we visited um, Putsi Leisure Center, Airbra. Where else did we go? That, there you go. The counselors who attended will get a little good something from me. The ones that didn't come, we will return all the bananas in front of you. So yeah, it was really, really good. And it was just very comforting to see the work in our leisure centers, encouraging active lifestyle. So I just want to use this opportunity to say, thank you very much. We did see lots of grass in air, bro, but we know you're going to sort that out. We also saw um, lots of sweeties and chocolates in the um vending machines and we've been told they'll be replaced with nutritional food is that right yes yeah, uh, there you go so he said it publicly now yeah <laughs> so um over to you steve thank you chair um just to introduce myself i am stephen baker i'm the head of active leads um so as the chair mentioned it was a recent visit so it's very good to have you all there um, and anyone's welcome at any time as well uh, to come around and see the facilities that we do have and um, the team who kind of are responsible for those facilities as well and uh, for active leads is um as we've kind of all heard around the health inequalities is a huge area for us to kind of help and achieve massive amounts of improvements in terms of out reaching more and more people um, to get them active um, from the health benefits, whether that's physically or mentally, um, is key for us. Um, so in terms of as we kind of suggested last time, in terms of some of our priorities and the physical activity ambition work that we kind of highlighted last time and focusing specifically on two priorities around um, active people um, and specifically groups of people who aren't accessing services at this point in time and aren't uh, physically active, especially in terms of older people and children and families um, and also in terms of people with long-term health conditions as well. Um, so they're the kind of two areas uh, for us, but also in terms of active travel and how we utilize that as a means to get more people active um, every day, um, rather than just through physical activity or sport as people might highlight um, or kind of see it as a bit of a puff when we use the use the word sport. So it is about activity and just getting people moving more um, in general terms. Obviously, in terms of our side of things, we have got a few challenges ahead, uh, like everyone's kind of already highlighted in terms of cost of living and the effects that will have 
is obviously from a leisure side of things that's a, a discretionary kind of spend element um so we need to make sure from again that what we do and how we do that um the likes of councillor Ruiz kind of mentioned around working with people who don't can't and won't afford it but also understanding the barriers to that role and just understanding it from a cost but benefits side of things um is huge for us also workforce very similar um we've got demand for swimming lessons for example where we just can't get the staff to actually accommodate everyone that's actually on those kind of waiting lists for swimming lessons and the likes and it's really important that we get everyone to have that kind of skill um it is an important life skill that everyone should have entitled to um so again from our side of things workforce is a huge area for us um, where we're kind of struggling a little bit to accommodate that kind of side of things but also around the diversity of that workforce as well is huge um, that we kind of are doing a lot of work around but in terms of that side again getting people from bank communities for example into kind of our kind of um, employment um, is a challenge and we continue to kind of try and address that um, because again having that diversity in our kind of workforce will help us and generate uh, extra work um, across the piece as well and encourage more people to access our services. Um, so thank you, Chair. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's great. Yeah, I'm very, very passionate about active lifestyle. So yes, and hopefully the doors are open and it's very affordable for the common man to ensure, you know, um, that we breach that inequality gap because um, some people would love to keep fit and stay healthy and attend um, lots of our centres, but they do say to us, we're unable to afford it. So um, one of the great priorities and what we would love to see is that our centres, especially our fitness centres, are affordable for um, the ordinary person. So thank you very much for that. OK, I'm um, Sean, I don't know whether you've got any comment to add to what Kath has said or are you happy with what Kath has said? Excellent. All right, board members, we're going to have a five minutes break as well. So um, you should be rest assured of that. Do you want, have you got any comments? We're going to go into their performance update, um, which is the last item, but is there anything any one of you would like to bring up? Yes, Councillor Anderson. In terms of work for the board chair, I think there's just, I mean, this board covers such a massive spectrum of all sorts of things to do with health and adults. But one of the things that um, I think we've been, not let down, but we've been disappointed in the past when we've invited CQC to come to the board and in the booklet that's in the papers the local health scrutiny booklet page 55 para 1.1.5 it says um, about engaging with CQC and that they have an important role to play in the scrutiny boards and I do think it's important that although we could choose loads of topics we don't have enough time to do everything and I think it's important that we concentrate on things where we can have an influence on an outcome and where we're going to make things better for people. I mean, we can't on this board reduce waiting lists in hospitals or in GPs much as we would like to. So I think we need to choose things where we can actually make a difference for people. Couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Noted. Any more? Yes, Councillor, sorry, Dr. Bill, then Councillor Gibson, then Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, before I go on to the one I was going to mention, can I just support what Dr. Clement said about workforce? I remember being in this very room five years ago, and the CCG were telling us in five years' time, we're going to have a lot more doctors and we're starting to train more now. We are five years down the road. This morning, I was reading a report of the NHS Confederation Conference last week, uh, and one of the facts that came out there was that GPs were seeing 11% more patients than they were five years ago, but 5% fewer GPs. So, I mean, clearly, they hadn't taken into account doctors that were going to retire, doctors which were going to go part-time, we really do need to face this, and I know it's not something we can tackle in Leeds alone, but we really do need to tackle this as a society. So that, that's very important. The thing I was going to raise, looking through the papers, um, a number of references are made to healthy diet. Uh, and I raise this, attention was drawn not to this particular fact, um, by uh, a voluntary organisation, Zest, 
that one of the things they do are, are cookery lessons in conjunction with Jamie Oliver's Ministry for Food. Now, I'm not making a, uh, uh, you know, a request on behalf of, uh, of an individual voluntary group because I recognise the, the difficult decisions the City Council has had to make about, about funding. But in, in fact, it was um, Councillor Anderson who uh, earlier this year did mention uh, about healthy eating. I know, and everyone knows, that some so-called junk foods are high in salt, high in sugar, high in fat. And some nutritious foods are more expensive, but not all. But it often requires a knowledge of how to use it, how to prepare it, and how to cook it. Uh, and so what I'd like to look at is what support we, either City Council and others, can give to people who are struggling. Um, Councillor Venner mentioned the cost of living crisis. Within that is a, is a food crisis. And we do actually need to help people make wise choices about the food they eat. Um, you know, in, in the documents, it talks about how uh, unhealthy food can lead to increasing obesity and early death. So what are we going to do to help people who are struggling manage to chain, to learn how to look after their diet, how to improve their diet, and therefore how to in, improve their health. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Um, can I ask Victoria to come in here, please? Thank you. And with reference to Zest as well, if you can touch that briefly. Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, in terms of paper 10 around potential areas of interest, I'd very much support what Dr. Bill has just raised. Um, we, I think it, it, it's very timely in terms of um, uh, re-looking at um, our uh, priorities and our approach around um, the whole challenge of, of um, healthy weight and, and sustainable food coming through the pandemic. So um, more than happy to, to, to bring a conversation back on that. And I think I would um, also um, want to um, share lots of great work that is already happening so uh, uh, you know we did have the conference yesterday we heard from some community organizations that are actually doing brilliant things in our deprived communities with recipe books and and you know food that's that's that working with local people so um it will be a you know it's really important we share we share great practice that's happening already as well as some of the things we would want to do um but i would absolutely welcome that i i i in terms of the um the particular contracts. I'm happy to briefly talk about that now, but it, 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 it's very likely to come up in the next item as well. And we have some colleagues who are, are very involved in that in detail. So I'm happy to... We can wait until to then. Wait, then. If yeah. that's better. Yeah, Thank that's you. Fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Councillor Venner. I just wanted to mention something briefly. My deputy, um, Councillor David Jenkins, is doing a project um, in East Leeds. He represents Seacroft. Um, he's piloting a slow cooker project. I think he's been very influenced by Jack Munro as well as um, as well as Zest. Um, it's a project where they're going to give out slow cookers to um, through a number of organisations with recipe books, with advice about how to use them. Because apparently they're very fuel effective, they're, they're cost effective. Um, and we've got a really wonderful. I think she's a nutritional psychologist who sits on the child poverty strategy group. And she's, um, so, this, so we've partnered with the university, they're going to actually evaluate the efficacy of the slow cooker project. So it's just a little pocket uh, that I, of um, a really innovative, interesting project that I, I thought I'd share. And you might want to ask them to report back at a later stage. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, Victoria, speaking about the recipe books, I can't remember what third sector spoke about it yesterday at the meeting. And I think you pay a pound for that. And you have a recipe book with different, I mean, that's amazing. I can't wait to see that. And that would just be great sharing with, you know, communities. And obviously, um, I'm not sure how diverse the, uh, the recipes are, because that would be another challenge for our multicultural leads, you know, to make sure that people understand the, um, the, the, the reasons why we are very big on healthy eating and making sure that the recipes are nutritional, and also affordable and make sure as well these recipes there are some 
I've seen recipes where you cannot even imagine where the name of the um, spice has come from. Uh, you can't even pronounce the name, never mind knowing what it is. So we have to also make sure these recipes are very user friendly and people from other communities can understand um, what we're trying to make them do. So thank you for that. So I've got Councillor Gibson, Councillor Taylor and then Councillor Farley. Then back to you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know. Last last year, you asked us our opinion on what we should be working on in the um, in the meeting. I don't know if we did that in the pre meet because I missed the pre meet. You did. Well, I apologise for meeting it. You know, I was in another meeting. Apologies anyway, so accepted. anyway, regardless. So um, a lot of the um, I, I did have a little bit of a think about um, some of the some of the issues that I thought we should look at as a as a committee, and actually, it, all of them have already been named by um by our by our guests um especially the the health and social care levy and um, mm -hmm. and lps as well um but i really wanted to um emphasize what um dr uh, clement had said around um mental health path pathways and it seems to me it's such a it's such a big um a, a big item to look at on the agenda that it would be it would be useful to focus on on uh, rather than just on primary and secondary mental health care on instead on uh, on a more uh, focused issue and and what dr clement had mentioned about uh, neurodiversity and those pathways in, in in particular i think would it would be really really useful i, I mean yeah. autism and um, etc cetera, etc cetera, and those pathways i think would be would be really good for the, the scrutiny board to look at excellent yeah thank you very much councillor taylor I'm going to say, Councillor Dr. Peel already highlighted what um, I was going to say, but um, I'm welcoming the Healthy House Councillor Venom and the Health Inequality. I think those two are absolutely marvellous. We had Healthy Housing a few years back where I used to lead in that, and I used to go around the council and find the right offices because Healthy Housing and health and equality, that's where it all started from. But we also need to look at our council houses before we start, you know, throwing stones in glass houses. And I think that's really one that I'm really looking forward to work with. Um, can't remember the name that talk about waiting lists in the hospital. I know we have got a pandemic and they do know there was a lot of operations set back during the pandemic, but I don't know, how long is it going to be for the waiting list? It's a silly question, you don't know, but I'm just thinking of a matter what else scrutiny is saying, the poorer health should improve first. The waiting list, I could go down it and I could see all these people in the private areas at the bottom of the list. And it's something that needs to really tackle, not you, but from central government across the country. You know, a pandemic, we are coming out. I do understand there were priorities with the pandemic, but now it's time for us to put our shoe on and keep going and look for the deprived area because they are the one that's suffering, waiting. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Tim, for removing the chocolate from <laughs> the machine. And I would expect Councillor Venner to take this matter to all the um, ledger centres. I've been complaining for years that I don't believe chocolate should be there when you just have a workout for young people. It's better to see a fruit, it's education. And healthy cooking should go back into schools to help educate the kids. And maybe that's something Councillor Fenner would like to look on because all the um, cooking, sewing, basic skills removed from school. And sometimes this is where it starts from the young people. Thank you. Thank um, you very much, Councillor. Yeah, Chair, just come? as a yeah, point of clarity, you. it would be Councillor Arif rather than me. Um, however, yeah. however, I do know, um, Councillor Taylor, that you totally practice what you preach because when you were the Lord Mayor, you removed all of, all the cake and scones <laughs> from from the council afternoon tea and made us eat fruit. <laughs> so. I agree, Councillor Vanna. We were all thin after Councillor um, Taylor finished her term. It yeah. did work, though, didn't it? I bet your sugar level was down, your diabetes was a bit, but now it's back up. Okay, Councillor Farley and then Councillor Burke. Sorry, Councillor Farley and then Councillor Anderson, then Councillor Burke. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, I think throughout that discussion, there was a, a number of themes that came out of it, and I think one of them um, was around workforce. Um, now, I know where we're different at. Workforce is a massive issue currently within within the NHS, but also kind of across um, sports services. So, I suppose my, I think what I would like to see. Um, you know, throughout this year is a bit of a report back on workforce strategy from from across the different anchor organizations within the city. I'd like to learn more about how you're working together. Um, obviously, as we move towards um, integrated care system, um, there's going to be much more closer working, but how then are you also tying in um, uh, how are you tying in kind of you know, the university as, as, as a source of um, um, at the universities as a source of uh, nursing, AHP staff, um, midwifery, where there's a huge issue at the moment. Um, how also are we are we working? Um, I know that uh, Councillor Venner touched on um, the uh, gypsy, uh, gypsy and traveller community and the health outcomes, but I suppose there's a wide question there about how do we how do we look at um, all of our um, BAME and minority communities and how are we involving and including them within the health economy, not just as, as patients and service users, but also as, um, also as um, staff. What are the pipelines to ensure that people from different communities are, you know, are looking at the NHS, are looking at uh, social care, um, as as valid options and options in which they can progress as a career. Um, so yeah, I suppose I suppose to condense what I'm trying to say here, um, what I would like to see is a um, is a bit of a workforce strategy for the entire city, and that might be a bit might not be the right um, the right audience, but as 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 a scrutiny um, committee, I, I think. It would be it would be helpful to have a better idea of what what's happening with the workforce in the round. Um, yeah, I appreciate we're not going to magic up some neurosurgeons overnight. Um, we're not going to magic up some nurses overnight. But I think there's a question around um, you know the shape and nature of the workforce and how that workforce redesign is taking place across the city between the partners and between the anchor organisations. Thank you very much, Councillor Farley. Well noted. Okay, Councillor Anderson. It was just a very quick point to back up what Councillor Venner said about slow cookers. Not only are they, um, well, what you cook in them is delicious, but they are very time efficient as well. So if you don't have a lot of time, you don't need to spend a lot of time on preparing stuff. So they are an excellent way of um, cheap and nutritious and good food. Fabulous. So Councillor Venner encouraged David Jenkins that he's got a big thumbs up from ourselves regarding his slow cooker. Fabulous. Right, Councillor um, Burke. Thank you, Chair. I was um, quite excited, which probably shows what a sad life I lead, to hear that you're starting to consider intersectionality, because I think it's uh, a vital component, particularly of health inequalities uh, that are linked to mental health. And I, if I may, you're not doing so, please with that. We, we kind of put things into separate boxes, don't we, without considering that link between them. And particularly in communities, I think that link is of vital, vital importance. There is one thing I'd like to see added or perhaps emphasised more, and that's the preventative measures. We're talking about healthy eating, which obviously is a preventative measure. But in terms of mental health, and I know there's overlap and synergy between them all, I think it's we tend to wait until people in crisis are launching towards crisis. And, and that's, I think, is an area that with some more emphasis on that, we could reduce the other side and perhaps close off that revolving door. And I think intersectionality is the key to that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Burke. Anyone want to respond on? Yes, Victoria, thank you. Can I just make a general point which sort of echoes Councillor Burke's points just there? I think um, 
I think often we use kind of health and health and care and and wider health and well-being sort of slightly interchangeably and often mean different things about the health and care system. So sometimes when we talk about the health and care system, we talk about healthcare services. And other times we're talking about the whole the whole um, range of things that influence good health as well as how we treat people <laughs> when they need it. And um, and the, the point around um the, the, the general point about at this point coming through COVID, um, knowing that we can't fix the problem alone, you know, the NHS can't fix this problem alone. It needs, we all need to work together as a city. And I know board members probably know that, but often it's sort of, it, it, it's not joined up in a way that we often n- need to do it as uh, as much as we've ever done now. So um, I think maybe to keep that check on, um, you know, how much are we going upstream and, uh, and, and really looking at keeping people well in communities as well as what treatment they need when they need it, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a point very well made. And, and I think that that cuts across lots of the different agenda items for the future. So it's just something to bear in mind, which I, I think is really helpful. Thanks, Councillor Burke. Thank you very much, Victoria, and thank you everyone for your contributions and questions. It's break time. So please do have a drink, hot or cold drink, just stretch your legs as well. And um, see you in, it's 2.42 now, so I need you back for 2.47.
and taken up by carers for that. Um, we've also seen impacts on care home admission, and there's a bit of a narrative around that. So certainly during COVID, we saw um, a real reluctance of citizens to take up um, care home placements as, a, as the, the way they wanted to receive their care and support. Um, and that rate has dropped with working age adults. What you do see, however, is the rate for older people's admissions actually went up. But if you compare it to 1920, it's still down. It's the fact that, sadly, we had so many deaths in 2021 that the only way was up in the following year. So you need to look at some of the trend information. Things like the CQC rating, CQC changed their inspection activity and moved it to being risk-based. So they only inspected those services where there, there was an indication of concern. So it's not surprising that more inspection outcomes were rated um, either um, inadequate or requires improvement. So the good overall rating we had in the city of 85% of um, services being rated good or outstanding has drifted back. Um, what I'm hoping with the resumption of a more normal inspection regime is maybe that will move back positively in the right direction. One of the other things we did um, during the worst of COVID, because we're still not out of COVID, are we, um, to support system flow was we flexed how the reablement service worked. So we both stopped taking admissions from the community to purely support hospital discharge, and at times took people who didn't really have reablement potential. It was more ordinary home care, but we did that to support system flow. But as a result of that, the percentage of people then who are remaining at home after 91 days at, at, after a period of support went down. You will also th see things like learning disabilities and paid employment, learning disabilities, uh, people who live at home and with their families. That requires us to undertake an annual review. And again, because of the increase in demand we had for assessments at the front door, the thing that had to give was planned reviews. So I suspect that people are still living at home with their families. I just haven't had the capacity um, for the social work service to go and do those reviews. So, so I think what I would say is um, I'm not surprised by this. Uh, let's just see where we are in October, if we were to benchmark, and then see again where we are in a year's time. Uh, and I'll leave it at that and take any questions. Thank you, Kath. Okay, board members, any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Venner. I suppose I just wanted to reiterate the point about not having the comparator data. Um, that, as Kath said, we're not surprised by this data and it will be interesting to see how other authorities have fared. And I don't mean this comment to sound like I'm minimising anything at all, um, but things like the quality of life indicator, if you think about the period it's covering, I think all of us would probably have rated our quality of life as not being as good as in previous years. So I think, I think it is really important to not, Overreact. No, no, I don't want to underreact either. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to minimise something, but I think it's important not to overreact and see how our data compares to other areas and also, as Kath said, how it compares going forward as we start to come out of the immediate crisis that we've been in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yes, Kath. I just wanted to add one more thing. We have five indicators around carers and most of them went in the wrong direction. So we're having a bit of a reset about carers at the moment. Um, I've been talking to carers leads and there still is to a degree of reluctance by carers to, to start to use services again, but we we it feels somehow in the middle of COVID, um, information about how to access services, 
to have confidence again in services has gone away. So we're thinking of things like having a meet the provider event. We've got four sitting services. They're underused. They were underused before COVID. So there's something about our service models aren't quite right. But I just wanted to particularly pick up on that because I think unpaid carers have had a really, really tough time. And we need to really challenge ourselves about stepping up support for carers in as many ways as possible. Thank you. When you say they've gone in the wrong direction, what wrong direction are you referring to, please? Um, so there's a number of survey questions uh, that asks carers, um, are you getting as much social contact as you like? The answer was no. Um, well, it, the percentage dropped. Um, are carers satisfied um, with the support they get? The answer was down a notch. Um, what else was the uh, our percentage of carers who say they're consulted about their loved one's care? That percentage went down as well. So there was a number of indicators. If you look at the Appendix 2B, sorry, it's quite a quite small writing uh, on, on the uh, chart, but you can see it in those uh, domains where if you look at the, the actual performance in the previous year, the number has gone down. Sometimes just a little bit, sometimes quite a bit. The, the one that always seems to be a conundrum uh, is around information about services. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm doing a piece of work called The Listening Project, which is all about gathering insight about how uh, particularly Black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities understand and access social care. Uh, and I think the big message we're getting is there's still an awful lot of misunderstanding about social care from people thinking it's part of the NHS, um, that it's free at the point of delivery. Oh, they're the people that take your old person away and put them in the care home. So, so there's, there's a lot of urban myths. So I think there's quite a lot of work we need to do to explain adult social care, what it is, what it isn't, and how to access it. Thank you very much. Councillor Taylor. Kath, I think you're quite right since the pandemic is dropped. And I think it's dropped because one, a lot still don't understand that we are coming out of pandemic and um, they can go direct. But I think the complaint what I'm getting in my ward and maybe other councillors is the telephone system, press one, press two, and so on and so on. And um, you talk about BAME, they most black, I'm going in black, are very proud people and they want to look after their own family and keep them safe and thing. And they don't feel as though you are taking them away. They just don't know how to, they don't want to ask to put burden. But I think communication with adult social care and carers are very poor because I, for instance, I cared for my dad and I cared for my granddad and social care didn't know about it. I'm not blaming you for one minute, but I'm blaming doctors because doctors know what's going on. And I think that's where the communication kind of locked. And in my conversation I always says the unknown. You don't know the unknown, but I believe doctors know where those individuals are. And that's where the conversation should place with you too, to take it from there. But um, I can only speak of black, black just like to look after ourselves. They do need help, but they feel like they don't want to act. And when they decline, they can't, can't be bothered. And that's what it is personally. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. I think that's um, also a cultural thing that cuts across um, lots of other cultures as well in terms of caring for um, elderly parents. I know with the Asian community as well, that's really, really huge. And I must say, I was very shocked when I arrived in England for the first time and I heard of a nursing home and I thought, oh my goodness, who takes their parents to a nursing home? And then as I continued to live here, I understood that's how it works in England but um, from the country I came from we all cared for our parents and I've never ever seen a nursing home or a residential home in the country I'm from so a lot of these things as well with the BAME community is very very cultural and we just feel you know your parents looked after you all your days growing up and when they're old 
old it's you know our turn to to care for them but you know it's a cultural thing as well in terms of um caring for elderly parents and also caring as an unpaid carer because you you know certain cultures just feel is something you should just naturally do yeah thank you very um councillor burke and then councillor farley thank you chair i, I would echo what my colleagues um councillor taylor and, and abigail both said but i think there's a, a different dimension as well. And certainly uh, the people I speak to in my world, there's a high level of suspicion around adult social care, totally unfounded. I'm not endorsing that. But there's, there's a perception almost that once adult social care are involved, they will lose some power, they'll lose some control, and they will take over, in inverted commas. So perhaps there's a communication piece of work there around um, implementing that reassurance and actually convincing people. I don't know if that's through community committees or where it's just perhaps something to consider that people do have deep-seated suspicions around adult social care. Totally unfounded, but it's just a fact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Fahmy. Um, yes, uh, uh, just picking up on the point about it being um, being an unusual um, set of circumstances, obviously uh, coming out of the pandemic and obviously we've seen a number of, of downward trends. Um, I'd just like to ask if there are any um, comparisons or benchmarking organisations against which we're going to be um, going to be comparing our statistics. So we, we are part of LG Inform, Government Inform, where we, uh, we, as in autonomous local authorities, put all our data into that data set. Uh, we also, so this National Adult Social Care Outcomes Framework data goes to the Department of Health and Social Care. So you're able to benchmark by uh, re region. So I can do it across Yorkshire and Humber. I can do it by my SIPFA group. So where you're matched with uh, cities or areas that have a similar population, because obviously demography can do different things to your statistics. So I benchmark all the time. Uh, I use it as a key tool to understand what's happening, how good our services are. Yeah, so we, we're easily able to do that, but not until October. Okay, thank you. You've got a supplementary question? Uh, no, no, I was just going to. I was just going to ask Kelly. Wait, when will we? When will we know how we've done? But you've answered it already. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Bill. Thank you, Chair. I, I might be jumping the gun because Kath's been talking about the the pages following one six five which is adult social care update. Um, but prior to that, the, there's a series of public health performance reports um, starting on page 155. I just wondered if Victoria is going to have any comments on that because I'd like to, to pick up something there. She will, she's nodding. Okay, Victoria. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I, I can just say a, a, a couple of um, words for me. Um, so in terms of the report, obviously, it includes the headline measures on, on, on the health of our population. The, the, the report does show that we're starting to, and in that it, I guess it was inevitable uh, to see the impact of COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic on, on, on the health indicators. And I guess the most significant thing or the change in the report is, is the increase in children's obesity, particularly in, in reception age and, and, and particularly in our most deprived communities. And, and I believe that does reflect the national trend and it needs a national and a, a, a local response. Um, on the, on the plus side, what I'm, I was pleased to see is the increase in, in the number of the NHS health checks that really fell back during the pandemic. Um, so that started to, to increase. Um, but yeah, looking forward to the, to, to the debate. Um, we've obviously got Anna and uh, Janice here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Victoria. Thank you, Chair. Just to um, add a few comments to Councillor um, Arif's opening remarks. Um, so just as a quick reminder, um, uh, this is a six month update on the last performance um, report we um, brought. And um, 
then then it was it was generally too early to start to see any impact of covid um and, and what what we're just starting to see now through this report is is the um some emerging impact of covid so in terms of headlines um the ones that um i wanted to bring to the board's attention um as we've already discussed in the last item, we're keeping a very, very close eye on the um, the uh, what's happening with life expectancy across all groups. So that's Leeds as a whole um, and our most deprived and least deprived population. So we can see that gap. Um, and generally, you'll see from the commentary that there, there has been very small decreases in life expectancy in every single group. Now, they're not significant enough for us to say that that's a trend yet, but if they continue, it will be. So that, that's, that's, that's the sort of early emerging direction of travel. Um, and we know that they'd stalled for the last 10 years anyway. So we've had, it's been, they've been basically flat, but if you, we're just starting to see them all come down. But that stubborn gap between most deprived and least deprived is still there. Um, so that's one to watch closely. It's, so it's it's not significant now. It might be the next time we bring this six, six monthly report. Um, as Councillor Arif said, um, we when we look at our population health outcomes, and there's nine nine of which were updated on this um, report. Um, there's generally a similar. Um, slight would downward trend in the wrong direction for most of those measures so it's tiny little small changes in most of those population measures which um as of now aren't aren't um significant enough to say we're seeing a, a, a definite change it could just be a natural variation so again like the life expectancy one we're we're, we're monitoring that closely and we'll um, and we'll, we'll see what happens with the next um lot of data as it emerges but the one that um there's two that are a, a, an exception to that so there was two um in, indicators that were um uh, significantly different um, and had worsened, um, which was the proportion of people requiring employment support for mental health, common mental health conditions, which had increased significantly. And that reflects what we've already said earlier in the meeting around that challenge around mental health. Um, and the other one is, is as Councillor Arif's already said, the, um, the, the measurement of reception age children who are um, obese. It's an awful, uh, we, we want to turn it around and talk about children's healthy weight. And in all of the things we do, we talk about children's healthy weight. But in this measure, it is actually measuring the, the, the children who do um, come up as obese at, at that age. Now, um, Janice is very helpfully with us today because Janice um, can, can bring a lot of detail if people are interested in um, exactly what story that's telling us. In very broad headlines, um, we are seeing the starkest increase we've ever seen as long as we've um, uh, um, had these records um, and, and how that plays out in the population, that it, it's, it's mainly in the deprived groups so that's that's two two issues of concern that there's a jump at all and and it's impacting most on our poorest communities but Janice has a lot more information both on the the data but also what we're what we're doing about it as a city so um I'll, I'll just um allow Janice to come in um after I've um just finished um saying a few more things around um, the, the other thing the report does cover um, are, are operational indicators for the services that we deliver and commission as a council. And the general, the six of those that were updated this time, and, and as Councillor Arif has said, um, the, there's some, the, the general narrative there is that our public health services are performing well. Um, but of particular note, um, because we did talk about it last time, is that there has been great improvement in the NHS health checks that are being performed, so that we still have a backlog, but that is started to that is a, an improved position from the last six month report. Um, and the um we continue to, to perform um 
very well compared to the rest of England, the rest of the region and the other core cities on our drug and alcohol um, service outcomes. And we've recently received additional um, funding to increase the provision of that service. So there's some good news stories around um, the performance of our service. But overall, it's against that backdrop of real challenge around what's happening with the population, particularly around healthy weight. So I'll just briefly hand over to Janice if you want to add anything about the children's um, data, Janice. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. And thank you for inviting me along this afternoon. Um, just one upbeat thing, because it is a really shocking measure, the fact that the rates have increased at the level that they have. It's a very unprecedented rise. But actually, um, uh, I just want to give credit to the Leeds Community Healthcare School Nursing Service, who go out and measure the children in schools, because actually we're one of only 18 local authorities nationally who, could, who submitted enough national child measurement performance data last year to be able to report on this. So we managed to um, weigh and measure over 75% of our children, which does mean that we have got the results that we've got for our reception children. When it came to measuring year six children, we didn't meet, well, we, we measured uh, quite high proportion, but we didn't get a representative enough sample actually to mean that that data was robust. So in the reports that were produced in the last year, we are actually just focusing on uh, the children living with obesity in, in, in reception year. And as Victor Victoria and, and Councillor Arif have already said, we've seen an unprecedented rise. It reflects, it mirrors what's happened both in Yorkshire and Humber in England. Leeds isn't an, out, an outlier when we put the data within that context, but it is still very much highlights that uh, this is an area we really need to be focused on going forward. I think, again, if we think about um, the rates amongst uh, children living in our most deprived areas, we always had... Um, in the data, we always recognised that if you lived in the most deprived area in Leeds, you were twice as likely to be living with obesity as, as if you lived in the least deprived area. If we take last year's statistics, and we tend not to just look at one year when we chunk down the statistics year on year, actually, but if we did just take last year, you're three times as likely to be um, living with obesity if you live in a deprived area in Leeds, just based on last year. If you're black, then uh, you have a higher rate of obesity than the general population. Um, that's not based on this year's figures, it's based on the previous uh, data. But if we think that the general population prior to this year had a rate of around 10.1, black children, their rates 15 point, I think it's 15 15.3. Uh, if you're Asian, you also have a higher rate as well. So it, it's, it's a, an issue of deprivation and also ethnicity. Um, so, of course, not, not great news, uh, but I suppose one of the things that I'm able to share is that many of you will be aware that as an authority, we were doing quite well on this measure pre COVID, um, we do really uh, believe that this huge unprecedented rise is due to the COVID uh, pandemic because it impacted on the three biggest evidence-based items that cause child uh, obesity. So that's access to healthy, affordable food, access to um, physical activity opportunities and emotional health and well-being. Um, so so we, we recognise that. But all of that said, you know, it is a call to action. It is um, a stark um, time really for us to say we really do need to redouble our efforts on this particular issue so so in terms of what we've been doing um obviously with covid we we did have we've got a strategy we had a partnership some of the work was slow due to the covid pandemic we've regrouped as a as a partnership we've held a consultation event with parents and also wider wider partners to refresh our local plan because i think you know we we recognize this is a multifactorial issue and we're going to have to take action not just work and with the families, but also to try to influence the whole wide environment to ensure that we have leads as an environment that's supportive uh, in, um, in helping families to uh, support their children and raise their children to be a healthy weight. So, um, so we've, we've held the consultation um, event and now we are refreshing that plan. But um, as a local authority, we've also pledged uh, um, our commitment to the Healthy Weight Declaration, which states that um, as a whole council, we'll consider the impact of our decisions on health, healthy weight 
Um, and so again, we've got an action plan linked to that. That's across all age. That's not just for child uh, obesity. Um, we've a, a really exciting piece of work in the pipeline there where we're looking at whether or not we can uh, use the government push that's been slightly stepped back from, but that is still moving forward around high fat, salt and sugar um, advertising of foods. And we would like to work with partners within the authority to look at our own advertising space to see whether or not we can influence in order that actually we do not promote high fat, salt and sugar items uh, on, on our particular area. So that's a, a biggish piece of work that we'll be looking at doing in the in the, in the near future. Um, it's complex because, of course, the commission and all that space is very uh, is very complex, but, but we plan to move that forward. Um, we're also um, very much looking at um, working with wider partners. So, for example, I've, I've just recently met with my colleagues in Active Leisure, and I'm aware that they're currently trialling some um, cheaper, affordable sort of uh, physical activity opportunities in Armley. So we're talking to them about can you also organ organise um, a parents group out, out in that area, um, a Henry group, which is a parenting group to support families to, um, again, understand what the healthy diet is and physical activity, but also how to set boundaries with their children and, and strengthening their parenting skills as well. So, um, And the Henry programme remains, I think, very much the jewel in our crown in that we know that from our previous data, it was having a positive effect. It was particularly impacting rates in our deprived areas. So we're back on track to uh, deliver at least 90 groups. That will be our children's centres and our 0 to 19 uh, public health nursing service. will be working on that. And just in this last uh, few months, our colleagues um, in Children and Families Directorate, our, our um, health and wellbeing team, have launched a Henry 5 to 12 um, parent scheme. So they're working with staff within our schools to deliver those parent programmes from schools for that, uh, for families with that wider age group. It's a massive programme. I could probably sit here for the next 15, 20 minutes and talk about it, but I suppose perhaps people might have questions. So I might be as well to stop there and just, does that feel right? And then if anybody's got anything specific to ask. Thank you very much, Janice. That's great, especially hearing the outcomes of what you do, obviously, post pandemic with helping the children and really pleased that the parents are actually um, a huge part of this program because children will only eat from parents, you know, a child is so little is what you give them as a parent that goes into their belly. So really, 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 really pleased. In fact, I used to think, oh, we should start finding some parents, you know, but hey, it is what it is. Um, we won't, we're not that stringent. So, but I am really pleased that you're taking parents along in this program because I believe that's where it should start from. So thank you very much for that. Yes, Councillor. I just want to come in and just give some sort of reflections in terms of having being an elected member for an area called obviously Hare Hills, Gibson Hare Hills, and, and what sort of happened during the pandemic. In our more deprived areas, um, some of these kids or some of these parents, they, they've got back to back housing with no gardens. So when they weren't going to school, that physical activity just wasn't happening. A lot of those parents also relied on food banks because they've lost their jobs. Um, so in terms of the, the food that, that, that the, the, the parents um, or the children were consuming, obviously, perhaps wouldn't be in the normal food as well. In terms of just mental well-being, it was a very, very difficult time. And we knew that our most deprived communities did bear the brunt, brunt of COVID. So whilst it's awful to see these figures, it's actually not surprising. Um, and I think you use the, the word call to action. I think this is the time now for us to double in on those, those efforts. But it, it, it really was difficult. And that's why I guess we've got a role and I've got a role to play as exec member for parks as well, as in terms of how we can work with, with active leads with the parks to how better make sure some of our parks I always say where we don't have gardens for the kids parks should be their back gardens and how do we make that possible and have that access um so yeah just just wanted to bring that anecdotal um, experience that I had in my local ward thank you yeah. thank you very much yes Councillor Benny yeah just to add that we added um green space as one of the work streams on the child poverty strategy um after the lockdowns so we've had always had work streams around you know readiness for education employability um best start but we added green space as a di direct result of the experience of children um you know in council Aris ward and across the city because there was such a disparity in experience of whether children had access to a garden and green space in lockdowns council Aris ward 
is the ward of highest deprivation of all 33. It's also the ward with the most children. So we've added access to green space and we've got people from parks on the child poverty strategy board, which they didn't have before. And they're doing projects like there's a Lincoln Green project, which is all about creating a green, green space and a kind of pocket park, for want of a better word, amongst um, you know, the high rises in, in that ward, which I think that's sort of the sec second, second most deprived ward. So um, yeah, it came out as a really, really clear um, inequality for families, whether they had access to green space or not during the lockdowns and their, their, their experience of lockdowns were vastly different as a result. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Venice, stark reality. Um, Councillor Anderson and then Victoria, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Janice, for the work that you're doing. Um, I just wanted to ask at what age is the damage done to children and can it be reversed by the time they get you know halfway through school that's one question um, you know if it's done before reception a lot of schools have got the healthy schools award and they work towards that so what impact is that having because if it's not having any impact then we're spending money for no good reason um, are the figures of the obese children are they skewed by the standards that are set I mean what counts as an obese child Maybe, um, I mean, I, can't, I couldn't tell you what the healthy weight of a nine-year-old should be because I've never had any children. So I don't know what counts as obese. Um, and do parents get told the results of the children's weights and, and measures? And they, I'm really concerned about diabetes and what we're storing up for the future. I mean, in the report, it, there is a, a bit of a, well, what I think is an anomaly. You've got, um, might not be your report, the, the papers we've got, type one and type two diabetes are shown in one graph, but type one diabetes is not avoidable, whereas type two is. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Um, so quite a lot of questions there. Um, but if I just go back to the beginning, really, I think it's worth noting that kind of the work that we do around um, healthy weight actually starts from um, preconception and that there's um, a set of actions that we we are working with colleagues with maternity services around to promote to maternal healthy weight because we do know that um, unhealthy weight tracks from um, you know, tracks through families. Um, the work that we do around promoting breastfeeding, for example, is really significant because breastfeeding is a protective, it has a protective impact. So we really understand, I think, that the earlier you're able to get into this, the better it is for the family and the easier. But that said, um, it's never too late. Um, we, we, you know, and, um, and the work that the Health and Wellbeing Service specifically do is absolutely fantastic on this issue. I mean, they have worked um, with schools for very many years around the development of what they call whole school food policies. So that implements, um, you know, goes across, cuts across not just the curriculum and whether the school is teaching um, cooking classes and nutrition, which many, many schools do do, um, but also it looks at, you know, what the kids bring in their packed lunch and it also looks at um, the uh, whether you know what they bring is birthday treats almost you know so there's a whole range of things there but then in addition to that as I mentioned it's that team that's also rolling out the 5 to 12 Henry program so they're very very much involved and very effective they one of the things that they've done very recently is they're piloting the healthy weight declaration for schools so is that the school then thinks about in all its decision making what's going to be the impact of this on the weight status of our children so so you know i have to again really uh, applaud my colleagues in children and families for the work that they do in that area um, and in terms of diabetes i think diabetes is, is is a really fascinating um you know sort of well a, a very concerning area and, and I, I think many of you might have noted and I, i've just put some data um some information down but the bbc reported the royal college of pediatric and child Child Health's National Pediatric Diabetes Audit results uh, last week, and it highlighted actually that the incidence of type 1 diabetes did increase significantly um, among children 0 to 15 year old, as did the numbers of children with type 2 diabetes. And as you say, um, the mechanisms involved in those two things are very different, with type 2 diabetes being much more clearly um, linked to your day-to-day -day diet than type 1. However, there is a diet link um, in terms of type 
type one and, and, and the prevalence and there's further research going on but as we become a more overweight um society we are seeing increases in type one diabetes so there is a there is a link although it isn't it, it's different than in type two it's not the only factor within there there's, gen, there's a lot of genetic stuff and other stuff thank you very much councillor thompson Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a specific question on the breastfeeding rates, um, quite concerning how static they've been for such a long time. Um, clearly, support during the pandemic was particularly difficult. I'm just wondering if there's anything particular going on to build on that at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Um, so breastfeeding, is, is, as you say, particularly with with COVID pandemic, um, we had disruption of services. Lots of other areas uh, have had, and um, actually, due to capacity issues in our 0 to 19 public health nursing service, they're running uh, with quite a high vacancy factor at the moment, and that's a national shortage of um, nursing staff. Not, not. It's not just a local issue. Um, the level of support that's being able to be provided has has hasn't been as as it was pre-COVID. I would like to say that's not to say that they're not doing a um, you know there's there's not support out there. But I would I would have to say that uh, we've had to reduce um, the amount of the antenatal work, particularly for families who are what we call universal families, those that um, you know we don't feel have any additional needs. However, that said, um, we do do um, a, a great deal of work with the breastfeeding peer uh, breastfeeding peer support service. Service, and uh, we have invested further funding into that and that is actually picking up quite a bit of the capacity that 0 to 19 fins haven't been able to, to manage. They uh, offer both face-to-face -face support and they offer online support and um, we have a specialist breastfeeding support clinic, virtual clinic for any parents that um, have been identified as struggling. So, so that work um, continues in terms of direct support for families but again rather like obesity if we want to increase breastfeeding support really and we're very serious about that we have to make leads as an environment much more breastfeeding much more breastfeeding friendly and um, so there again is a tranche of work a program of work which we could happily share in more detail which is actually looking at um you know how we how we um encourage local businesses to be breastfeeding friendly for example whether how we have very strong positive imagery of breastfeeding in the local areas um, a whole a whole host of different activities under that plan too thank you very much um did you want to come in yeah. question how many places in leeds where mums can feed their babies in town centre because I remember back in 2015 when Councillor Moharin was the chair of this board I was fighting with her to get places in Leeds where mum could feed their babies. I'd like I'd really like to say that there's more than there would be in 2015 because our um, breastfeeding friendly initiative has been popular and um, I don't know there's very specific figures but that's a figure we could come back to let you know how many how many local businesses and uh, other organizations have signed up to be breastfeeding friendly that that's a statistic we can we can provide it would be also good if you have signs around Leeds to say these places where mums can go, because I go to the gym in the lights and around four weeks ago, someone sat at the stairs covered up and feeding their baby. And I, I just think if it's highlighted that they know where to go, they will go. But if it's there and you don't know, you just won't go, will you? Yeah. Yeah, the, the scheme the scheme includes a, web, a website, so there are there, and um, and everybody puts a sticker in their window. But I, I agree, it's only a you know, yeah, we, more publicity needs to yeah, be out in that yeah, one. Yeah. Very pertinent point there, Councillor Taylor. Thank you very much. Okay, did you want to come back, Victoria? Well, only to say I'm very mindful that we sort of um, halted John's question from before and and, um, and Anna's here to talk uh, um, about the um, particular work we're doing uh, with, with adults and healthy weight. So I don't want to, to miss that opportunity. John, I don't know if you want to ask it again, because Anna, Anna we yeah. can all hear it now. Well, I, I actually wanted to explore some of the graphs on page 155. Um, Victoria says uh, a 
steady fall in life expectancy, but not statistically, uh, but not statistically significant. I used to teach medical statistics, and statistical significance is not the same thing as practical or clinical importance. And particularly when you're looking at trends, if you look, for instance, at the least deprived men, uh, they have been reducing since 2013. Now, you could argue, are we, you can't expect to live forever, but actually you do expect it to level out rather than decrease. And that's, that's you know, getting on for a decade of decreases. Something is going on and we need to be asking what is happening? Why is, is that happening? And if you look at the, the graph below that, infant mortality rates, um, in, again, actually, in, in the least deprived, um, and, and Victoria will say to me, and she's right, um, well, it's very small numbers. It is very small numbers, but the increase has been going on for a decade from very low figures. OK, you could argue that it's not very large now, but it's, it is an important increase from what it was. So what is going on? And lastly, um, on, on the, the lower right hand one, prevalence of obesity in, in children, if you look at the most deprived sections, that has been increasing. And, and the very last one could be the beginning of COVID because that goes into 2021. But actually that trend was starting in 2016. So are these real um, important deteriorations in health? In which case, why is it occurring and what are we going to do about it? Okay, so I'm happy to come back on that. Thank you, Dr. Beale. Um, so um, it is incredibly important, even if it's a very, very slight change, as you know. Um, I think um, it, it feels really important for us to tell the, te tell the story of what was happening before COVID, um, because the, the headline there is that since, um, si since, um, since the First World War, over the last hundred years, we've seen a steady increase in, in, in as you know, as you know, John, um, life expectancy. So people had a reasonable um, expectation to live longer than their parents for, for generation after generation after generation over the last hundred years. And what happened in 2010 was that that, that increase stopped and started to level off. Um, now, the, the sort of um, general commentary on that was around it reflecting um, uh, uh, austerity in its broadest sense and the sort of a, 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 a halt in the rise of sort of general kind of um, economic and living conditions. Because um, as we know, there's a very, very strong correlation between health outcomes and, and broad social and economic outcomes. So that was the sort of commentary going into COVID. Um, and everything we know about COVID um, means it's very highly likely for us to start to see the declines that we were seeing just before COVID um, to continue. Um, so this was particular. So this was happening for both men and women. But the commentary around um, what was happening with um, the women in the poorest groups in society was particularly worrying pre-COVID. And we talked about it pre-COVID. So we know that, for example, in Leeds, um, women in our, our poorest 10 percent um, had, had started to decline slightly more than men in the same in the same categories of, of poverty. Um, so there's something going on about um, how this is impact, particularly on women. Um, and we, I know we've had conversations in health and wellbeing board around sort of women bearing the brunt of um, austerity and also the, the pandemic. So that's not surprising, but it is it's real. Um, so all the things we know are the reasons for it. Uh, John, um, are, are, are those headlines that Marmot sets out, you know, um, around children having the best start in life, people having um, decent jobs, housing, education, etc. cetera. Um, so this is not about people um, being poorly educated and making bad decisions. This is about the, those building blocks of health, which are about where they live and work and, and how, you know, the quality of education and opportunities for children. Um, so um so that so as we as we know the the impact of the pandemic has not been equal um what we would expect to happen is for that um 
is, is for that gap to be gradually widened through COVID, um, but even but 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 affect everybody um, negatively. So we we would expect that sort of general downward trend to continue. Again, this is an England thing, and it's a Western democracy thing. This is happening all over Europe as well. So it's certainly not just a local issue. But the reason why we've we've been proactive and committed to being a mom at city um, is we know that actually locally we can make a difference to all those things that marmot says um, wh and what's been encouraging from um someone like coventry which was the first marmot city is that when they got the data for the west the rest of the east midlands which was basically showing the same pattern as this with stagnation and then very gradual decline what had happened for coventry is that wasn't the case they hadn't started to decline and actually things had started to improve. Now, whether that's entirely down to them being a Marmot City and actually acting on all of those reasons, that, that you know, you never, you're never hundred percent sure. Um, but it but it, it's it's good enough evidence to, you know, to 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 without all the other evidence that we have, is that that, that we know these are the things that make a difference, hence why we're really um committed to um addressing those wider determinants of health. So that I, I guess that's that's the broad answer, um, and I guess the 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 challenge for us is to keep challenging ourselves. Are we doing are we doing the right things? Because we know what works. It is a solvable problem. It's just the will of ourselves to commit to 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 those actions. So I, I, I guess that is the bigger challenge locally. That that you know um, how we want to be brave and take those recommendations forward. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Have you got a supplementary question? Just, not a supplementary question, just to say thank you to Victoria, because actually to recognise that things are not always going right, and even if they're not statistically important, they, they might be clinically and practically important. And to hear, you know, Victoria saying, you know, we're, we're on, on the case and we're going to improve it is just what we want to hear. Absolutely true. Thank you very much, Dr. Bill. Now you see why we love you on this board. Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Taylor. Victoria, I think that was very well laid out because you talk about women, you know, suffered during the pandemic. Women are the, what you call the post that all the hours of. I don't know what you call it, it's whatever it is. So all the burdens, because they have to worry about their kids, they have to worry about where the next meal coming from. So this is why it's affect women. But we are doing things, and I know that you and Kev and the others in LCC are doing the very best you can, but it's difficult to reach everyone when you would like to reach them. So we can with yourself, Kat, Fiona, Salma, and everyone, thank you for what you're doing for our community. Thank you very much, Councillor Taylor. What she was also trying to say about women is that we have just specially made. Okay, I would love to hear from Rob. And then um, Anna, please, thank you. Uh, no, I don't think I've got anything to add to Cass, can't we? <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming, Anna. <laughs> I'm not sure what was discussed earlier, so it's a bit tricky for me to, to add, but I, I think um, Victoria probably wanted me to um, add some information about the work we're doing around um, adult obesity um, and healthy weight, as we prefer to call it. Um, so a lot of the things, as Janice described, are, are all age. So the healthy weight declaration that the council signed up to is very much a commitment across all ages, so children and adults. Um, a couple of key things I just wanted to uh, probably share with John in, in case uh, it wasn't shared earlier. So stop me if it's already been said. Um, but uh, we are looking at um, what weight management service we can provide in the community. Um, from next year, which is when the cuts take effect. Um, so we've got a series of workshops working with NHS partners to look at well, what's the best support we can give people to lose weight and look at what, what that best service would be and then hopefully seek some funding from the NHS to um, help us with that. So that, that's um, well, something we're working on at the moment quite actively. Um, I think another key issue is the food strategy that the council is leading uh, in Polly Cook's team and public health very engaged in that process and see healthy weight as part of that approach. And particularly uh, as Janice described, the work around advertising and what we could do as a council around that and healthy foods. 
Thank you very much. And I just to ask, you know, the healthy weight declaration, is that a council um, declaration? It is. Okay, excellent. I do know a lot about Polly's work because obviously I'm food champion as well. So um, in terms of um, what the kind of food in schools as well, the health is that I know, they are on the ball with that. So we actually have other councils wanting to emulate what we are doing in Leeds. So i um, quite impressed with that. So thank you very much. Okay, any other comments? Questions? Fabulous. Steve, you got any updates for us? Um, I don't know if Councillor Arif wants. <coughs> um, I, I will go ahead, so that's fine. Um, so yes, we've just seen the performance report is around inactivity levels um, across the leads, and as you can see from the report, it's highlighted that we've significantly kind of dropped inactivity rates, um, which is very positive from our side of things. Um, following obviously a rise during the COVID kind of period. Um, so from our side of things, that's very encouraging uh, that we are recovering. And it's probably fair to say that compared to other cities, nationally, regionally, we're actually performing very well in terms of that recovery of that inactivity rates. Um, so from, from that side of things, it's very good. Um, but obviously that information does kind of mask some of the, how universal that inactivity rate is um, and we're probably seeing the, the recovery slower in um, our deprived locations people who um, separately in terms of BAME communities as well um, along with kind of women and older people and people with long-term health conditions as well so obviously from that side of things it's not so good um, but again from a Leeds perspective we're actually booking some of the trends uh, in terms of that side of things and we are seeing more people being active than ever before. Um, obviously, during COVID, we made a huge step period um, to help with that recovery. Um, and there's a lot of hard work gone into that, helping that and supporting the teams um, across the board. We are, it's very encouraging as well, just to see in terms of some of the activity rates in the leisure centres, very popular. And obviously, it's clear that people are putting that activity as an, an important part of their lives. Again, when we look at um, cost of living increase and those kind of things, that's going to help um, kind of hinder some of that elements. And we've got to think how we do that better. But from our side of things, it's very encouraging that we're seeing more kind of younger people accessing their services, um, especially um, in terms of our health and fitness memberships. It's very good. Um, and again, that actually books the trend across the uh, nationally as well, where actually children and young people are actually uh, in that activity rates are actually going on a downward trend whereas I was going up, upwards trend um, so that is very encouraging similarly in terms of health and fitness memberships um, swimming lessons school swimming elements all those are actually um, back to pre-covid levels which is faster than what we probably thought they would do um, originally as well so it's a lot of encouraging stuff in there but obviously again kind of hides some of the inequalities and health inequalities that we've kind of talked on um, before so there's a lot more work that we've got to do in helping to address that. And again, harking back to our, our kind of combined work with public health in terms of our physical activity ambition and the side of things that we're kind of progressing on that front as well to really kind of drive down um, activity rates in terms of um, our most vulnerable um, parts of society and the likes as well. So lots of encouraging stuff, but yeah, still a lot more work we need to kind of do really. Thank you very much. Yeah, lots of encouraging stuff and more to do. So thank you very much. Do you want to say something? Yeah. You talk about young people and activities. You need to encourage the elderly as well, because I think sometimes it's your marketing, not just you, marketing that does it. Because if we encourage, for instance, the over 60s that can get discount from the ledger center to use that facilities, that will put less pressure on the NHS with their diabetes and blood pressure. So we are focusing on young people, we are quite right, but we also have to remember that some elderly need that to maintain their health as well. So sometimes it's your marketing and how you sell things to get the buyers in. Yes, definitely. And uh, it's probably fair to say our marketing kind of side of things has changed substantially over the last few years I've been here, um, very much marketing 
with real people um, with a, a vast array of different um, ethnicities and the likes to, to try and encourage more people to access the services that you know coming into a gym environment is quite a scary place for a lot of people but from from our side of things it's about encouraging real people to come and that's why we use imagery which is very much that aspect um, and we don't tend to use lots of energy anymore because one it kind of dates very quickly but also has that apprehensive and stereotypes and the likes as well so we use encouraging kind of marketing um, around using the words and very much around that video side of things and, and making sure that you know the health and just moving more is really important our, our kind of marketing campaigns have changed on that front but it's still a lot more to do and encouraging those side of things in it's probably again encouraging that our older generation actually are more popular in the less than what they have been before um even pre-camp um, covid kind of times again so it's, it is showing that it is making improvements but again we've still got a long way to go to encourage more and more people to come in and get moving a little bit more thank you very much Stephen. right so we've got councillor anderson then councillor arif then councillor thompson and last will be councillor harrington just a quick one chair um I hope that we're not just counting the number of people with gym memberships as a success because we all know that loads of people have gym memberships but not everybody uses them so do we track that people are actually using them as well or is there a significant proportion of people who have had a gym membership for years but have actually very rarely used it again during COVID it's kind of allowed us to reset things a little bit so previously we probably did have a lot of what we cast in the industry as sleepers so people who have a membership but don't actually use the facilities um so it's probably fair to say that that rate was quite high uh, but obviously during covid as people dropped out and um cancelled a lot of their direct debits and different things and we also cancel uh, memberships in general terms as well um so we've actually started off at a, a, a level footing now where people are active and it's probably fair to say that again during the stats we're actually seeing more people visiting more often than what they were doing before so previously it's probably about one or two times a week uh, we're actually getting that up to two and a half times a week to three times a week um, so again people are actually when they come in they're coming more often as well which is, is again an element for us to kind of work with but we're not just concentrating on our own activities um, there's a vast array of different activities as you've mentioned around parks and different things as well so as part of our kind of side of things it's encouraging people to get out there and about and just walking a little bit more cycling using active forms of um, transport and lights to kind of help us get there so it's not necessarily just around our activities we encourage everyone to do a little bit more um, outside that as well but that's harder Thank to track from that side of things okay thank us. you councillor Ari. Thank you, Chair. I think just going on back to Councillor um, Taylor's point about marketing, I think she's absolutely right. Um, I think, you know, sometimes typically with gyms, you think there's, there's a certain idea of what fitness is. And actually, it was really encouraging to see the campaign that we did, which, if I'm not mistaken, Councillor Thompson was involved in. And I believe Councillor Bithel as well. So that was just sort of everyday people. In fact, Councillor Marshall Cutting, I think you were in there as well, somewhere, if I recall. And, and the idea behind that was, people from all backgrounds all different shapes and sizes can 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 go to the gym but I think from for me it's also about how do we create that link of mental well-being to physical well-being I think that's got to be really important and sometimes you know we can go into communities and 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 do to them but how do we do do with are we actually asking the communities what is it that you want as your physical activity let's be honest some people in our more deprived communities well let's be frank they can't even afford to have a bike perhaps even to even store it somewhere. So what will actually work for them? You know, um, we do in the community committees, we do a little exercise with the Youth Activity Fund and we ask the young children, what is it that you want us to spend your money on? And you'd think they'd say football, but actually but some young lads came back with cooking skills. So actually, you know, it's almost, we need to go back to the community and say what works for you and create an environment where they can go for little walks around their little local area and, and, and empowering that sort of stuff. And I think that link between mental well-being and, and physical well-being. And then we have got an issue within the BAME communities. I know culturally, some women may not want to go into a, a, a swimming lesson where there's men there. So I think looking at those, and I, I think in Burnwells, we offer women-only lessons as well. So I think there's broader issues that we need to tackle um, and, and working with the community. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a question about where we're at with social prescribing for physical activity. Um, I know there are some part run practices in Leeds, although they're fairly spread out, wondering what else might be going on if there are things that could be developed there. Thank you. 
yes, there's a lot more in terms of social prescribing and kind of working um, with each other and partners and organisations across the board. So we are in, in involved in those elements. Um, it's probably more fair to say it's more around our people with health conditions and the likes that we kind of get in and kind of work with. Um, nationally, we're also part of um, UK Active, who are kind of looking and working with the NHS in terms of social prescribing to kind of help us fund some of those memberships and those type of things that we can tap into as well. So uh, we are doing some pieces of work in social prescribing, and we've also got our, our, a bid in now at, at this point in time in terms of um, to the Department of Transport um, to help us with that social prescribing and locate locate um, localities as well um, in our deprived locations. So we're doing a lot, but it's again, we can still do a lot more and we, we still need to kind of work a bit more on that as well. Thank you. And I'll take the last question from Councillor Harrington. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, well, one was about it was about social prescribing and what's actually going on in the outer areas because there are some pockets of deprivation in the outer areas, but the, so the leisure centre at Weatherby, for instance, is quite expensive to use. So if you come from one of the three areas of deprivation in my ward, then it's quite difficult to go and actually access those activities. So that's one bit. How are we encouraging GPs to get involved with social prescribing? Because again, there's a lot of people within those areas that have got long-term health problems. Um, and the, the final bit is, what are we doing about refugees? Because in the outer area, we have taken a lot of Ukrainian refugees, as well as Iranian. So Garforth have got the, the Iranian Afghan refugees still there. And what are we actually doing about encouraging them? Because some of the physical activities would help their mental health. Mm -hmm. And certainly the ladies that we've been speaking to in the Weatherby, the whole of Weatherby Ward, we've set up a support group for Ukrainian guests um, and their hosts. But they're saying, well, it's, it's all well and good. But um, they've said that we've got, we can have access to cheaper sports facilities. But there is only the one leisure centre in Weatherby. And when we went in there, they didn't know anything about it. So there's a little bit about marketing and actually advertising it and making sure that staff are aware of it too. Thank you. Yeah, if I just take the um, point around the cost elements um, uh, first. Um, yeah, I mean, as we kind of, Councillor Reef kind of mentioned before, we are looking at the in terms of cost as a barrier um, to entry. So we are doing a bit of a pilot at this point in time to understand what are the true barriers because ultimately there's a lot more than just a cost as a, an activity because not everyone wants to come to a gym, for example, not everyone wants to come to swimming. So it's about a lot more in terms of that elements and around supporting people and getting the social element right as well. So there's a lot more than just the cost as a barrier um, to entry. So as part of this pilot, we need to understand some of those barriers a little bit more succinctly because cost is always a thing, but ultimately we really need to drive down to how we actually support that. Um, and, you know, in terms of the kind of leisure card and the Leeds card, extra kind of discounts that we do do, they are substantial discounts. So for example, the Leeds card extra swim price and lights is discounted by about 60% compared to our normal kind of rates. So we do have mechanisms in there, but encouraging um, different people to come in is a bit more than just um, dropping a price and that element. So we really need to understand um, that. And hopefully through that pilot, that will be kind of then citywide once we kind of understand that element. But again, we need to kind of understand and um, kind of monitor that effectiveness of that program um, before we kind of take it further. Um, in terms of GPs, um, we do work specifically with GPs so they can refer back into our kind of health programs team. Um, so that's a number of different elements from cardiac rehab to fall prevention and the likes as well. So uh, GPs practices and we are seeing a lot more referrals coming in that way and using um, obviously physical activity as a preventive me measure to help. But also after kind of operations and the likes, um, we're kind of doing a lot more in terms of that side of things. So. GP side of things, we, we always encourage more and more to come on, on board with that side of things, but it, we definitely are getting more and more referrals coming in. Obviously, from our stone staffing and, as I said, around recruitment and those type of things, we 
the demand is there and it's just how we can cope and um, support that changes so again we're kind of looking at how we can because any type of activity is good for people no matter what health condition they've got um, so just getting them to be moving more is really important so how we use size and the effectiveness of the team as a whole in terms of those side of things rather than just using the, our clinical kind of um, members of staff who have had the qualifications of likes that need need to have that specialist support is how we encourage people just to come in and we can support them um, no matter who it is or the like so in terms of the large centers offering we can support that, those mechanisms and we're branching out a load of, um, a lot of training with the staff at this point in time to help and encourage them on that behavioral change kind of mechanisms um, but also understanding some of the, the, the facts of um, some of the conditions as well in terms of refugees side of things, um, we have supported them, uh, especially in terms of the Ukrainian offer in terms of free kind of membership um, to the facilities and that is across the board and that's in that welcome pack that each uh, Ukrainian refugee gets. Um, so that is part of our offer um, in terms of that side of things. And then again, from asylum seekers and refugees and the likes, we also offer the lease card extra price as an element um, where they can tap into um, again to get that reduced um, elements. The team have also worked specifically in locations such as Garforth and the likes as well to support people who are in hotels and based in the, those areas as well to get them into activities. So for example at Garforth we opened the doors to them using the facilities there for free. We provided coaches and activities depending on what they were looking for. So we worked with them. We also provided them with some equipment and um, clothing to be able to do those activities as well. And we got that kind of um, kit out for the nation at the minute in terms of people donating equipment and clothing to help support these type of uh, in activities as well as we recognize that actually having the clothing can be a barrier in itself to activity and lights as well so yeah we are doing quite a lot there's still more and more kind of things we can do in terms of that elements but the team are working specifically in in that kind of areas and working with communities team to kind of get that support there Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of that agenda item. So huge thank you to the adult and social care team, public health, active lifestyle. That has been great. Um, truly, truly appreciate your comments and um, response and all the hard work um, you all are putting to ensure that we have a very healthy and active um, lifestyle in our city. We would now go to item agenda item number 12 on our work schedule. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as set out in the in the paper, the uh, the report presents a a, a draft work schedule, um, which is informed by the work of the board in its previous year, um, and also further discussions that have been held between um, the end of that year and now, um, and also attached to the draft minutes from the executive board held on the twentieth of April for any specific comments from members of the board. Um, clearly, the discussions today have been quite wide ranging um, and as reflected by members already, the, the remit of the board is, is significant. Um, and I suspect that, that actually what, what is required is a, a, a review of that work schedule and bringing something back to the board um, at its next meeting chair, which identifies and reflects on some of the specific issues that have been raised at today's meeting that members have, uh, have particularly highlighted. Um, just in terms of particular themes that seem to kind of come across throughout the discussions, I kind of noted down three specific areas. Um, be useful to know whether that accords with members' views, really. Um, one was around the, the health inequalities theme, um, also a workforce theme, and also mental health theme. Um, and perhaps that needs to be reflected in the, in the work schedule chair, but happy to receive members' comments. Thank you very much. Members, yeah, keep it short, please. I'll try my best. Um, yeah, no, I would agree with those with those three themes. I think um I think like it does it does come back to um uh some of the points that have been raised earlier around um you know how are we providing providing kind of you know, 
both health and social care for all of our communities. Um, there's there's um, the points that I raised with regards to ensuring that kind of we've got an integrated workforce, but also looking at um, workforce streams and making sure that the workforce across health and social care reflects the communities that it's serving. Um, and I think, yeah, absolutely, with regards to mental health and ensuring that parity of esteem between um, physical and mental health. Thank you very much. OK, so our next meeting will be on the 19th of July, pre-meeting for one o'clock and 1.30 for the rest of us. Thank you all so much for your time and your participation. You're a great group. Thank you so much. And do not forget to clear your tables, your cups and your saucers, please. Thank you.